If you've ever been to Boston's Fenway Park, you've seen baseball players swinging for the fences. But what you also probably experienced but didn't realize was the Red Sox's Sarah McKenna, Senior Vice President of Fan Services and Entertainment, swinging for the senses. Listen in on my conversation now with Sarah about how she's built a reputation using sights, sounds, smells, touch, and taste to influence the second sale. I'm here with Sarah McKenna, the Senior Vice President of the Boston Red Sox. And I hate to use this term, Sarah, but an old friend in the sports yeah, business. Definitely. And, uh, so first of all, Sarah, you are from Springfield, Mass. originally, correct? Yes, I am from Springfield, Massachusetts. Out here, we call it the 413. Okay. The 413. That's our area code. <laughs> and then you end up for the last 20 years, almost 20 years, working mm-hmm. Boston Red Sox, uh, yes. being a Massachusetts girl, you have got to have the dream job um, to be able to work in your hometown for your beloved team. So few people in sports ever get that. I mean, do you just have like the perfect world right now? Um, yeah, except um, we're doing this via Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good to actually be at work um, and be with uh, my teammates and seeing loud, large crowds and hearing people and smelling Fenway Franks and doing all that sort of stuff. And I don't even think I'd mind right now if someone like spilled a beer on me. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's those little things we tend to miss, don't we? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> the, cell, uh, the smell of beer. <laughs> so, but all your friends from back, you know, growing up days, your family, they just look at you and go, man, were, were you just, did you get luck out or what? But of course it wasn't luck. And we'll talk about what got you there, but I hope you're pinching yourself a lot because. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, uh, I'm thankful and it's really, you know, the team is fantastic. Our ownership is fantastic, but to go to work at that ballpark every day, it's just gorgeous and it's just perfect it is so imperfectly perfect um it is it's fantastic it's you know once in a lifetime well you know sarah as you know i've been very blessed in my career to be able to visit a lot of stadiums and arenas Mm -hmm. world. and one of the cool experiences that most fans never get to have is walking into an empty stadium or arena right Mm -hmm. um could be early in the morning, the morning after a big game or the day mm-hmm. of a big game. You get to do that every day at Fenway Park and you get to see the green monster. Does that still give you a rush? Um, I prefer it actually when it's empty. Um, I mean, I love it when it's full, sure. but there is something um, uniquely uh, special about it. And I think it's unique to baseball too. I mean, you use the word stadium and you use you the word arena, but we, you know, and when you're thinking about all the different ballparks, like I have so many ballparks that I love, you know, you love Petco Park, you love Seattle ballpark, you love Camden Yards. And each of them, I imagine, you know, and, and I've been there in a lot of ballparks when it's sort of empty for batting practice before the gates open or when you get there earlier before someone else. Um, but I have been at Fenway park also when you're completely alone, light towers off and we have what we refer to as the sweeper lights and they're sort of the stadium lights at the back of the grandstand, but they're so far back because our overhang is not very big and we have those field box seats and the way those lights illuminate into the grandstands and push down onto the field and you see, whether it's the Sitco sign or the Prudential Center or the Hancock building, and you can just kind of see that skyline, it's, it's really cool. Whether it's at 5 o'clock in the morning because you're getting ready for opening day or it's at 1 o'clock in the morning because you stayed late and you had to get work done after everybody left. So, It's, it's romantic, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, oh, incredibly. Yeah. It's, uh, it's special. It is. It, it, it's like... It's like the field of dreams every day uh, yeah. with, with work like that. And mm-hmm. that's just a perk of working in sports. And I'm, I think any entertainment business, whether it's a stage or a theater or a concert hall, to be able to walk in there um, when no one else is there is just a very unique experience. It's kind of like a temple 
for sports, right? Yeah, totally. And, uh, so you just, and, and what's also cool in your job, and we'll talk about your job, uh, you get to provide unique experiences to people mm-hmm. that they have probably looked forward to all their lives, or they get to give that experience to their kids or their grandkids. And mm-hmm. you're the you're the catalyst, right? You're the provider of that experience. I, I am in on the secret before the secret is unveiled, shall yeah. we say. <laughs> I mean, does that ever get old? No, but I am, I do at times miss the element of surprise. And, but I do enjoy sometimes like, I remember one time it was the 4th of July and we were doing something and, you know, one of my friends was, happened to be in particularly close seats on the third base side. And I was walking in from left field after there was um, a great flyover after the anthem, but we were doing a military reunion before they really were a big deal. You know, it was like 2000, it was early 2000s. And for some reason I was able to get a woman from South Boston from the Navy off her carrier, like things that I probably shouldn't have had the right to do. (laughs) (laughs) and and, um from the persian gulf and then via bahrain to come to surprise her her family so she got in late at night her family thought that they were zoom um you know doing sort of an early version of a facetime what we're doing now and um the guy says to me you know in his you know in his total boston accent he's like that was sick you know and i'm like wait for it wait for it (laughs) And he's like, what? No, that was it. And I was like, no, it's not it. And then, you know, he shoots me a text message later and he's like, that was awesome. And so it was, so I love, I love being able to do that, but I also love seeing how other people do it. When I, when I look at my peers and other sports and and other teams and it's cool to see what they do. That is, um, you can't really put a price on being able to bring people those experiences, those memories. It's right. better sometimes than a paycheck. I know that sounds idealistic, but uh, it really is because those memories will go on forever and people, and you're the person that produced that memory for them or that you, that, you know, that you provided it. Um, and so it's one of the great perks of working in sports. Um, yes. And you do it so well, and you do it for a storied franchise at, at, a, at a ballpark that is really, uh, you could say, you could argue it's the mecca of baseball. Right. right. Yeah. It but, is. Um, and it's a, it's a real place within the city, too. Like, we've been here in this unique period and in the region, this unique period of time. Because when you think about Boston, you think about, you know, it's hard not to think about its particular place in history. Um, and you know, you think about things like the revolution or whatever, but people aren't going anymore, you know, to, you know, uh, um, certain places and gathering as a group. And, and so for, for a lot of years, it was, it was ballparks, it was stadiums, it was arenas. So when we think back to like the bombings in 20, in 2013 and other times in history, like we have been a place where people can come together and whether it's heal, whether it's cheer, whether it's express joy, whatever it is, it's been really cool to be part of that. Well, and you're going to be a part of that, obviously, in the next few weeks, next few months. Uh, I've, I've shared with my clients something they already know, but I just like to remind them as an outsider to their organization that they are about to be a part of um, the healing of a community. Mm-hmm. Right? It's almost a catharsis, a cathartic experience when after the pent up energy of COVID-19 and the, and uh, the fact that we were staying in our homes and now with, uh, with uh, some unrest going on in our country and, and cities being used for demonstrations and protests and sometimes uh, worse than that. Um, Sports has such an obligation, such a responsibility now to be right. a healing agent. So, so yes, how, how do you and, do that? Um, I view it as a um, unique responsibility. I also view it as a unique opportunity. And I think, you know, you know, 
I had one viewpoint of this saying, okay, when baseball comes back, what are we going to do? You know, because we're going to have to acknowledge the lives lost. Mm. Correct. And, um, and we, you know, we've learned a lot about this and, uh, you know, we've learned the types of, um, you know, impacts that it's had on different communities versus other communities. And we've learned about how it, uh, has impacted certain age groups rather than other age groups. And, and so there's all these things that you kind of learn from what you're seeing in the news and, and what you're reading and what you're hearing from your friends and your family. And then in addition to that, there is this other la layer of social justice and equality and um, inclusion and um, all things that in some ways connect very closely to what we were learning from the pandemic from from the pandemic well you know the way to you know certain communities have been impacted and the way that um um individuals are have access to health care or rights or whatever it is mm -hmm. there are these unique synergies so and i hate to use the word synergies because it just doesn't feel right it doesn't feel almost human it feels like a business speak you know and it's and this is really a very human thing. So when I approach these sorts of things, I never approach it from the who, what, when, where, how. I approach it from like the, from the five senses, you know, and what did you hear? What did you see? Um, it's going to be really hard to give our fans, what did you smell? Um, but, you know, and did you get to touch anything? But I have a lot of great coworkers that I've worked with for a very, very long time. And we use the phrase, uh, sometimes and I have one guy that I work with and he'll always say to me, Sarah, I haven't cried yet. I haven't cried yet. And, um, and I think that's a really, really important thing that when you bring to whatever it is you're doing, it's that in order to get through it, you have to feel all the emotions before you can begin. And I think, you know, when I think about what we did after the bombings, and how we approached that particular day on our return to baseball, because it wouldn't be right to return to baseball and have this oh, oh joyous thing without recognizing what um, has just happened. Mm. I just, it would be deaf. It would be wrong. It would be all the, all the words that just make you seem ignorant, shall I say. So, and I think baseball is uniquely uniquely positioned for these sorts of things when you look at some of the sports and the reason being there is is that but it's also a real challenge because football plays once a week baseball plays a couple times um a month at home hockey will play you know a couple of times a month from baseball you can be in the middle of a 10-game homestand and you can go through think about what our last 10 days have been like and then what the 10 days before that were like Imagine if we were having baseball games in all the things that we would have had to do as far as recognition, awareness, healing, and providing all of those resources before you even get to the baseball game. So it's mm -hmm. the daily element of it that uniquely positions us to really be connected to society in a different way if you choose to go at it proactively. And it also um, is a large responsibility. And it is, requires you to be incredibly nimble, in my opinion. May I use the word stewardship, too? Yeah. Because yeah. you have a stewardship. Uh, you have a stewardship to a brand. You mm -hmm. have a stewardship to a community, to a mm -hmm. fan that pays good money to come into your games. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a stewardship to those that you work with, the players, um, your coworkers, et cetera. Uh, you know, I think, and as, I, as I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking about other industries, businesses that don't have to have all of these considerations that you just outlined. Mm -hmm. right? They can come to work and for the, for the most part, the outside world doesn't really see how they need to deal with the changing conditions. They don't, they need to be nimble for their business, but it's not out there for the public to see, right? Right. But everything you do is so magnified. Mm -hmm. and when I come to Fenway Park for my first baseball game amidst all of this stuff, I expect you guys to put on a perfect show for me. I expect mm -hmm. 
entertain me, to heal me, to make me laugh and cry. I expect to be well fed. I don't want any problems as far as customer service. I want to get the parking, you know, that mm -hmm. I want. I want good transportation in and out. So what an obligation you have. I mean, I yeah, and if, it, if you're in, <laughs> no, 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 I, I listen, I'm aware. <laughs> But if, and if to put on top of that, you're, you're a really big baseball fan because you're a Red Sox fan and you know your baseball and you're super smart about it. So there better not be one digit wrong in your stats either. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, you know, there's all the things. But that's kind of cool. I mean, it's good to wake up every day and have someone hold you accountable. Mm. You know, it's incredibly, it's incredibly motivating. Mm. And the stewardship is also... It's interesting because there's so many places that um, have the burden, shall I say, of trying out a lot of new tricks. <laughs> and, and lots of times I find myself saying, that's not what Fenway is. Like Fenway is not, that, that, that works fantastic in Tampa. That works fantastic in Kansas City. That works really well in Las Vegas. I, it's, I agree with you. It's a hundred percent cool. And it's awesome. Mm. We are, we are Fenway. Like we are, and it's a little like, um, you know, preserving a national park, shall I say, you know, like, you know, you, when you go to Yosemite Valley, you want your children to see what you saw in Yosemite Valley. When you take them to the geysers and prismatic spring in Yellowstone you don't want that ruined you want that to be exactly as it was in that connection in that thread of the generations and and that's what that's what Fenway is that's what people expect and that's what people want now that doesn't mean that we can't change for the better in a lot of ways and I think that we are and I think that we always will strive towards that but um, I'm going to forget the writer right now, but you know, the phrase, the ballpark is the star when they're referring to Fenway. Um, and you know, there's that phrase, it's the economy stupid. Well, it's the baseball stupid, <laughs> you know? So don't, don't mess with that. You know, no one came to see me or hear from me. They, they came to gather as a group collectively in a unified way enjoy this open space, the fresh air, all under the city lights while cheering for the same team. You know, you're bringing up such an interesting point that I have been thinking about, kind of scratching my head over recently. And you're really putting your finger on it. And that is that, let's talk about Major League Baseball for a moment. Um, I've been wondering a lot about the edicts that come from a league office. And I'm not here to, to bash on league offices, but when a league office says, whether it's responding to a pandemic or whether it's responding to uh, social injustices, when a league office says, this is the way we're going to do it. And every one of our franchises need to do it that same way. Now, I understand that if that's McDonald's saying that this is the way you're going to make mm -hmm. hamburgers. Mm -hmm. But you just talked about the personality of your community and, the, and the, the historic nature of your ballpark, which is different than the personality in Tampa. It's different than the personality in San Diego or in Kansas City. So how do you reconcile that? You're a good citizen of Major League Baseball. You're a leader in the, in the, in the business of Major League Baseball, but you also have to be respectful and mindful of your own local community and pulse. So how do you become a, uh, how do you play good citizen at a league level, but also be very responsive and responsible to your local fan base? I actually think the league allows a lot of freedom in that sort of way. Um, in the, the reason I say that is this because when we think of guidelines, it's, um, I often think of it, think of it in terms of access as part of like an agreement that you would, you know, um, or a security regulation or something like that. But ballpark to ballpark, we actually have a lot of freedoms to, I think, define our brand and say who we are. Um, I mean, so long as that fits within, you know, 
the expectations, I would say, of, of baseball amongst all the, the owners and the commissioner. Um, but I think that we have the ability to have our own identity. Like, they're not saying you have to do this or you have to do that. But they make suggestions a lot of times to all of us. And we're just like, yeah, they probably wouldn't play here. And there's not this huge animosity. It's just, yeah, well, you're different. And when you take that into a million different avenues, when you think about what we're going through right now, you know, um, should we be so fortunate to play, you know, we're going to get guidelines. Well, the guidelines that work when you're in a ballpark that's probably four times the size of ours, you know, and has actual real service elevators, like Fenway doesn't have a service elevator. <laughs> like just something as simple as that. People are like, well, that's in the lower concourse. And we're like, oh, we only have one concourse. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that separate one where you can, can do the things you need to do. Um, you know, there's going to have to be, and, and there will be a, a lot of, not freedom, but ability to tailor things to how it works within your own ballpark. Mm. Um, a lot of places are blessed with space, you know, even new Yankee stadium. I mean, I think their visitors clubhouse is it has to be four times the size of our clubhouse. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, there's space and it's not something, um, it's not something that we, um, have in our, in our area where we can, where, so when we look at what we're about to tackle here and you think about it from a distance, can it be done? Absolutely. It can be done. Um, does it take a lot of creativity? Yeah, it totally takes a lot of creativity. So you, know, you speak, speak of the uh, clubhouse. I've been inside the Red Sox clubhouse there at Fenway mm -hmm. and it would surprise a lot of people. Now, maybe since I was last there, some improvements have been made. I'm sure that's the case, but last time I was there, it was kind of shocking, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it just was. You would, think, you would think that the Boston Red Sox players would get the best, um, but I think they, I guess they understand that when you come play at Fenway Park, there are some trade-offs, right? Well, I think if you're coming to play at Fenway Park, you're probably not coming for the clubhouse. <laughs> like the the for for the locker setup like do you know what I mean and listen like it has it has gotten a lot better and there's uh, you know um and it's I think doubled in size um but not probably what you would define as the clubhouse which is the room where where all their their uh lockers are you know um but um that is still roughly the same size. I think some things have been moved around a little bit um, to free up some space and additional coaches offices to alleviate coaches being in there and add, you know, so that we aren't bringing in 20 temporary lockers during September call-ups or whatever the number is. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, that's, um, but keep in mind that that stair you're walking down to go to the, the dugout is the same stair that was walked down in, the forties or the, you know, the thirties. I mean, there used to be one tunnel when the clubhouses were a little bit closer. And I, I believe the story is there was a fight in, in between the two teams in the tunnel. So they, that's when they separated tunnels, I think for all of baseball. Um, but so I can't say it was the same one as it was in 1912, but I don't think it was that far off. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, but I think if you're coming to play for us, you know, of course, do you want to make sure it's comfortable and all those sorts of things? But I don't think it's your number one priority. I think you prefer that you're most likely to play to a sellout crowd. Yes. Now, speaking now, of the David, crowd. Yeah, I keep in mind, David Ortiz, uh, every game, I think it's every single game he ever played in front of at Fenway Park was a sellout. Hmm. Or almost so, every game. So, let, Let's talk about those sellouts. Um, so it's it. There's a reputation mm -hmm. uh, that that Northeast area teams have for being having some of the hardest to please fans. Whether you mention the Yankees, uh, maybe the Red Sox, uh, mm -hmm. I would say so the fans in Philadelphia can be hard mm -hmm. to please sometimes. Um, so how does that how how is that impacting the decisions the daily decisions and choices you're making because certainly 
uh, there's a love affair between the fan base and the brand, but there's also such high expectations between mm -hmm. that fan base and the brand. And you're the one, granted, they want to see winning teams on the field, but when the team is not winning or not w winning to their satisfaction, that's, you're kind of the backstop, right? Because you're providing that overall experience at yeah. the ball. So how does that play into your thinking? Um, and what's well, it working in a market I'm, like that? <laughs> I'm super lucky because we've won four World Series since I've gotten here. So fortunately, I haven't had to think about that on too many years. But you do have that year where you look at it and you're like, it's September and you're like, it's not, it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> or even earlier sometimes, you know? And um, so you know, that's when you start going back to, for lack of a better phrase, your bag of tricks of, you know, um, you know, the experiences of whether or not it's the on-field photo days and the kids run the bases and those things that are those tried and true things that you come back to. And, and, um, you know, when you think about it, and I actually think you're one of the first people that opened your pro you are the first person that opened my eyes to these things when I took a, a, a course with you back in Portland, but it was, it was, um, you know, thinking about what is that added value that you can, you can provide and just trying to do those sorts of things. What I will say is, is that um, what uh, I've learned through the years is, is that it's harder to do those sorts of things. It's, it's easier to do them in the start of the season, but what, it's not a very good vibe when a team is out of it, you know, in the, in the clubhouse, like guys are great and they're willing to do things or whatever, but you feel worse asking, like, you're like, God, you're, you're not winning. <laughs> I don't want to ask you to do something. <laughs> so that's where that one comes. Yeah. So. I, yeah. I think, I think children learn that about mom and dad, right? This is not. Yeah. The to ask. <laughs> yeah this is not the moment that we should be asking this, right. but I got to do it anyways. I think I like, I think I've told someone, I'm like, I'm pretty sure the worst thing in the world is asking you to do this, like during this time. <laughs> well, you probably have to, you have to use some of your sales skills, Sarah, right? Can oh you yeah. You, we, I sell it constantly. <laughs> I, here's the thing, Rob, I sell nothing. I do, I do not. We had an interesting conversation once. I remember being in a senior staff meeting and everybody had to go around and talk about their sales goals and their recent sale like something to that theme or whatever and i was like um yeah i only spend money <laughs> i don't sell anything <laughs> but i do i mean i acknowledge i do you know we use we use the phrase we used it when we were with the padres um total sumos vendedores like we're all salespeople, and um you know when you think about marketing like if I feel like I always feel like when young people say like I want to be in marketing and I'm like no you don't you want to be in advertising because <laughs> what if you really understood what marketing is like that's like an exhausting look at numbers like <laughs> you know what I mean like and and really dialing into zip codes and all those sorts of things and tendencies of buyers and but what you're thinking of in in the romantic phrase of of marketing is is you're thinking of more experiential. You're thinking of more creativity. No one really, there's very few people that say, I, I want to figure out, you know, when moms are buying, whether it's Tuesdays or Wednesdays, so that I can send them that targeted message, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I have a son who you know, Sarah. Mm -hmm. My oldest son works for Facebook. Mm-hmm. He works in the ad uh, department of Facebook, mm -hmm. and it's not about. He's not interested in trends. He's interested in behaviors, right? And so that's what he studies, and that's what he tries to predict. Um, mm -hmm. the The analytics that you just kind of referenced, he tries to predict behaviors and and what why would someone want to buy through this Facebook ad? How can we approve it? so that we are capitalizing on anticipated behaviors. Right. You. So, uh, but you, you have to admit, you are a salesperson, right? Even though you may not have- a Oh yeah, no. So, <laughs> so I probably should have followed it up with, I learned early that that was not the type of sales I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, shortly 
after I left Portland, I briefly worked for American Golf in San Diego. I was selling tournaments before I worked for the Padres. I think it was like a couple months. And I was like, I don't want to sell anything like this ever again. But I will say, I love the opportunity to sell you an emotion. Mm -hmm. I love the opportunity to sell you a feeling and to, um, and sell is probably not the right word, but it's to give it and to give it to you once so that you understand that if you come back here, you might be likely to get it again. And so I'm not in the business of the initial sale. I'm just not. Um, but I am in the business of the repeat customer, which I think is just as important of a sale. The second sale, the third sale, the I want to upgrade. You know, I had such a good time. I want to make it a 10 game package now. Like that is my job. And the people and the men and women that work in uh, all a ton of different ways that I've worked with over the years that are picking up that phone and making that first call of getting someone to the ballpark, um, whether it's been in Portland or San Diego or even in Boston, because, you know, we, we do make calls and contrary to popular opinion, like the phone is not constantly ringing off the hook, you know, but um, we do, we do our, our outbound sales and, I totally respect that because I think that's a hard job. It's a hard job to make that first impression in that manner. Um, but I am able to do it with a myriad of senses. I can show you something on the video board. I can make sure that that hot dog is delivered nice and toasty warm or, you know, make sure that all season long as you're coming in the gate, maybe that sausage vendor is right there and you're smelling those sorts of things. The sound was good. You may have heard your favorite song in a timely way. Like that opportunity to sell that repeat customer, it's all part of it. So I'm not in the business and again, I'm, and I'm classified under the operations side, but as a whole from our chief operating officer, we, it is a clear mandate. Like we are in the repeat customer business. That is what we are in. It's safety, security, repeat customers. So you're in the renewal business, like you said, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, customer service as, as you well articulated customer service is a sales function. Mm -hmm. It's just on the back end, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Taking the baton from the front end salesperson and saying, I'll, I'll take it from here. Mm -hmm. I will ensure the repeat business. So the fact that, that sales staffs work, they integrate well with service staffs, or sometimes we call them client success teams. But the fact that they're working together in concert to produce yep. the original sale and then to ensure the repeat sale, um, it's, it's very uh, integrated, those two functions. So. Yeah, and I love it when, like, say, the group salesperson I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of great people over the years. Um, but when you think about it and they're saying like, I've got this group coming in and last year they bought a thousand tickets, but this year they bought 3000 and I want to do a little something more for them. Like, what can we do? Let's step it up a notch. This is my idea. This is their expectation. If you tell me that in advance, like, yeah, I'm in. And I have staff that can, if that's all in, like, let's do this. Like you want to have a much more orchestrated conversation about making sure this happens and that happens. That's, that's awesome. And we're still doing that right now. Um, you know, we mowed a pattern in recently to our field um, of, for recognizing nurses. Well, nurses night is one of our biggest group sales. And as our group sales people reaching out to us saying like, Hey, we're coming up on a month of a whole bunch of appreciations, EMS workers, nurses, workers. They're some of our, they're one of our best groups, you know, all our groups are great, but, in specific, they're like, they're going through so much. They, there's this, there's that, there's this, there's that. What can we do for them? And our groundskeeper says, what about a pattern? <laughs> you know, and fly, fly the drone or, you know, the news copters will pick it up and tip them off. And, and you know what? That is, an, I, that is a c clear collaboration during a pandemic from a group sales leader to a, to a groundskeeper. Yeah. And it was fantastic. That's a great story. It's a great, it's a great illustration of how a team works together to get the sale and get the repeat sale. So yeah, 
And the nurses uh, feel loved. I mean, there's no losing there. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> there's no and losing. And there's also baseball, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so. I, um, I have to ask you about you. You mentioned Portland, and I wanted I wanted to bring that up because uh, for the viewers and listeners, that's where you and I first met. You mm-hmm. graduated from Providence College um, with a healthcare degree, correct? Yeah, Health- healthcare policy and management. Yeah. Um, really helping me right now for the record. <laughs> Having taken a few uh, epidemiology classes, oh actually. <laughs> well, so uh, I'm a West Coast guy originally. You're an East mm-hmm. Coast girl. So I got to ask you, how did you get from Providence to the Portland Rockies single-A short season baseball team, uh, obviously an affiliate of the Colorado Rockies? And if I'm not mistaken, you were an intern there, weren't you, Sarah, at first? Yeah, well, so, okay, so after college, it's kind of the thing back here. You go to New York, you go to Boston, that's what you do, you know? And I just wasn't feeling it, and I had a couple of friends, and we weren't feeling it. And so we just said, why don't we hop in a car and go west? And um, my dad had told me, I'll give you enough money to get there, and I'll give you enough money to get back, but however long you stay, best of luck, you know? and So I had had a few odd jobs over the years and I ended up calling Jack Kane and asking him for an interview. And he's like, yeah, come on in. Okay. Whatever. I mean, we both know Jack. Great guy. He was the owner of the Portland Rockies. Owner of the Portland Rockies. Rockies. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I came in and I met with him and he said, you know, it's the middle of the season because it was. I graduated. And, I mean, and we all know how long short season single in baseball is. It's not very long. So for me, it in the middle. I'm pretty late to the party. <laughs> and, um, and so I went um, and he said, you know, my jobs are all filled right now. And they were in his, you know, in his defense. And he's like, but you seem like a nice kid. I'll give you a job selling programs. And I said, um, well, I don't think programs are going to pay my rent right now. Um, (laughs) So I'm going to have to pass, but thank you. And I wrote him a thank you note and kept in touch um, a little bit, but it was probably the course of like two to three weeks. But the couple days before I had ridden out there in one of my friend's car. So I didn't have a car and we were living in Lake Oswego at a friend's house, which is not that close to Portland if you don't have a car. (laughs) So some guy that lived in that had a shop on the lake in the town of Lake Oswego, you know, saw me at a grocery store trying to strap groceries to my bike at one point. And uh, he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, do you want to come? I need some help in my warehouse. And so he, he's like, I'll give you a job. And if you get a new job, you just have to finish out the rest of the week. And if you need to go on interviews, you know, just, you can have half a day off to go on interviews. He's like, but it looks like you need a few bucks and you might need some help. And so this stranger out of the kindness is hard. I went, I rode my bike over and every day I worked in his warehouse, like making sure the shelves were stocked for his construction company. And, um, and I ended up being there for a couple of weeks. And then one day I get a call um, and it was Katie reader. If we remember from, uh, And she told me that Jack wanted me to come to a game. And so he asked me to come to a game and I sat with him and he, you know, we know Jack, he's like a huge personality. And he was like, are you really digging ditches and working in a warehouse? And I said, yeah. (laughs) It's like, well, I just can't stop thinking if you would do that, if you'll do that for that person, like, what will you do? What will you do here? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know. Let's do you want to figure it out? And he was like, yeah. So, it actually actually gave me a job. Like he made a job for me. Um, and so I'm eternally, you know, grateful to, to him for that. And then um, you just did a little bit of everything. You pulled the tarp because it was Portland. And um, I did the slingshot and played the music sometimes. And I sold billboards and sold groups and answered the phone. And, you know, and it was great. And I learned a ton. I think that everybody should spend at some point in their life. And if they are in, in sports, have the opportunity to spend it working in minor league baseball. And I think when I'm done working in baseball, I would like my final years to be in minor league baseball because it's just a lot of fun. It's so great. You get to do everything. 
Well, I got a, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, when you worked for the Rockies, uh, I was consulting with Jack and his wife, Mary, um, when they mm -hmm. first moved to the franchise from Bend, Oregon and Central Oregon to Portland. Mm -hmm. I would come in regularly because Game Face was a new company. We were, we were trying to, you know, get up on our feet as well. And we needed a good client or two. Yeah. Had some success stories and, and the Rockies became that. I, I just, I always have in my mind this vision of you when I'd walk into their office, which was in the bowels of the stadium. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember walking and you'd be the first person I would see. You'd be sitting there at that first desk. And to everyone listening and watching this, I got to say, Sarah, no matter what she was asked to do, <laughs> did it with a smile. Oh, thank you. <laughs> always remember that, Sarah. You yeah. always had that great attitude. And as I see all those people that went through the Rockies organization, and which later mm -hmm. became a triple A franchise and renamed. And um, so there's quite a legacy that Jack started. Uh, I don't think anyone could argue that you have gone the farthest in your sports career. Oh, I think there's been some people now. Well, I don't I, know. I, I, don't know. <laughs> I can't think of them, Sarah. You, you, you really deserve a tremendous amount of respect and accolades for how you took that minuscule opportunity you worked hard, you had a great attitude, you were a team player, and and look where you are today, working yeah. for, as I said earlier, one of the Thank most you. storied brands in all of sports and in a very, very senior position. It's just wonderful. I'm I'm proud of you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's interesting because like you can't, you know, you just have to, you never know what it's gonna be because my whole connection to San Diego when I ended up working for the Padres is because I was answering the phones. It was my job to answer the phones in, in Portland. Wow. And it was a connection made through because I helped someone. Hmm. So, uh, and that was really, that was really it. It was um, a gentleman from the commissioner's office of major league baseball and his daughter had gone to live in Portland. So he's calling from New York and there was some sort of issue. Um, I think it was she needed a doctor of some sort. And he said, who is your team doctor? Like he wanted to know, because that's what you do in baseball. You know, um, you know, my daughter's off to college in California and they're like, you know, and she's doing sports and they're like, she'll need a doctor. And I'm like, none of this team will take care of it. I'm going to call that team. I'm not going to, you know, if there's a real problem, you call the other team because we're so interconnected in so many different ways. Um, and it's, listen, it's the greatest part about working in sports is the access to, things like that and um and so he asked me to tell him something so I, I figured it out for his daughter and it was you know and then he called up again maybe a month later and he said we're, we're coming to Portland because we're going to visit our daughter what is your hotel what is your team hotel and then he's like um something happened and he needed to get there quicker and his assistant had gone on vacation he's like can you help me I, you know, book my flight. And I was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know you, but of course I'll book your flight. Wow. And we did this and whatever. And I remember calling him up because I couldn't get him on the phone. And in those days, like it was a little harder with like the credit card, you know, payments and everything. And I had put his flights on my credit card. And so I called him up and I said, I think it's great, you know, that you're coming to visit, but when you come here, can you drop off a check? Cause I put all your flights on my credit card. <laughs> And he was like, oh my God, I can't believe that. I'm so embarrassed. I didn't think about that. And uh, I was like, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and so when I left Portland, because whenever this gentleman needed something, he would call and he would ask me. Turns out he was very high up at the commissioner's office. And, and I learned that over, over the years. And I said, I, I've met someone and he's taking a job in San Diego and I'm going to go with him. Um, we're engaged and, and this is what's going to happen. And, um, and he said, uh, well, then I have to call the San Diego Padres for you. And he called mm -hmm. the San Diego Padres. And so then I get a phone call and I'm supposed to call this person. Once I finally arrive in San Diego, I call this gentleman. Um, he sets a meeting up for, with me for Larry Lucchino because of this person that set up this interview. And Larry Lucchino says, you know, I don't have anything right now, but you can have an internship. And I said, thank you very much, but my internship days are over. But what I really meant was, 
I don't think I want to work in baseball anymore because I all I do is dress up as a mascot and pull the tarp and answer phones. I don't want to pull the tarp anymore. Not realizing that in Major League Baseball, you don't pull the tarp when you work. Yeah. <laughs> and so, sure enough, I send a thank you note. I call, you know, I go out on my own and I go work for um, a golf company. I'm not really loving it. And I get a call from the same guy that set up the meeting in advance before with Larry. He says, Larry would like you to come in for another meeting. And I said, okay. And he said, I noticed you had worked on Capitol Hill as one of your internships. And, um, and I always, I, I liked that you turned me down. <laughs> and, and he said, and um, I also, um, we have a three month job working on the campaign to build the ballpark in San Diego. And I think in doing our stuff here at the ballpark in at Qualcomm, and integrating the politics with the baseball, do you, do you think you can do that? And I said, yeah, I think I can do that. And, um, and I've never applied for another job since because so, of, because of that. So yeah, a lot of thank you notes too. Well, really the, the little things that you're talking about, quite frankly, I have seen a lot of people who aspire to work in sports who refuse to do those little things uh, because they're too busy or because mm -hmm. they think, you know, that's old school. I don't need to do right. that. I don't need to write personal notes anymore. I'll just oh, maybe yeah. I'll send them an email, maybe, or I'll send them a LinkedIn message and that's good enough. But those little touches, they stand out in today's world. Right. And, and you stood out and you continue to stand out. But I got to also point out when Larry Lucchino, who is the president of the San Diego Padres, the CEO, when he hired you, you were taking a, a, a government relations job, right? Yeah. So that mm -hmm. you were manager of government relations, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So we had the campaign. I just was kind of a campaign worker to start. And then at the end of the campaign, the campaign was probably 20 people. Um, and they kept two of us from the campaign. And I was one of them. And then when he was eventually hired by the Red Sox to take the same position there, uh, you followed right up, right behind him, didn't you? Right, right behind him. Yeah. But now with a one-year-old in tow <laughs> at oh. that point. <laughs> yes, yeah. and a husband. We, we, we hit, you know, engaged to San Diego, but yes. And we all, um, we're all back in Boston. And my husband's from Boston too, which is nice. And I, I met him in a bar in Portland and he was wearing a Red Sox hat. Oh. And fun fact, today is our anniversary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> The fact that you're joining us on your anniversary, I want to yeah. thank him as well. Well, he's busy at work too. So. <laughs> well, the other thing that's interesting about this, this course that you're on, this journey that you're on professionally, is that one might think, wait, you got a, you got a degree in healthcare management. Mm -hmm. uh, you went out to Portland. You didn't know anybody in Portland except the friends you went with. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, know, you really had, everything just seemed so disjointed. And so people may think, well, don't I have to get a sports management degree or a sports administration degree? Mm -hmm. Don't I have to follow that tried and true course to get a Sarah job someday? But mm -hmm. you're living proof that more than the degree, what would you say it takes? I think it takes, um, I mean, it's sports, right? So you got to outwork your competition on mm -hmm. some level. Like that's just what you do. And you have to be flexible and you have to be open-minded, but you also, um, you know, you got to take your lumps when you get them and you just kind of got to get back up. You know, you can't take things too personally. Um, and you just have to sort of know your course. And in, in some of those things of what I did, I do think, you know, there's a lot of ways in which Jack and Larry are actually very similar. Um, and I would say um, that they know their value really well. And I think one of the things is when I told both of them, like, that's not going to work for me. Cause I said this, I turned both of them down to start, but they were both being very kind. You know what I mean? Like, so deep down, they're very kind people, but I do think there was part of them that appreciated, Oh, she knows her worth. Like she's, mm. but she's not being, but it's not being obnoxious about it. But when I called her back and said, I need you, this is what I need you to do. It wasn't like, let's, let's, you know, curtail that to me so that I can make it work for me. 
you know, you need me to do a job. I'm going to get my foot in that door. I'm going to take that job. And then once I've earned your trust, respect, admiration, whatever the word is, then let's define what it gets, gets to be. And I, and I think that's what I was able to do at, at both places. When I started, when I, when I left the Padres and then came to the Red Sox, everybody went to spring training and I, myself and Janet Marie Smith, the architect came to, to Boston and it was my job to get ready for opening day. And she was doing all the infrastructure work for the ballpark and the construction. I mean, she is, and has an amazing career and she'll be in the hall of fame someday and should be in the hall of fame someday. Um, such a smart person. Um, and, sh and I just remember saying, you know, there's a sale, there's this weird transition. And someone was like, what do we need? What's your title? And I was like, I don't even know what my pay is going to be yet. <laughs> I was like, I don't even know if I've agreed to this. <laughs> but I'm here because I'm part of the team because opening day is less than, you know, 30 days away now. And a lot has to get done. So I just need a laptop. I just need a cell phone. And by the way, could I have some health care? Can we get me on that really quick? So that's Learn where the healthcare major comes in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but and and then you figure it out you know like uh, what what my career has evolved to be rather than what i could have designed it to be is so much better hmm. you know i probably would have pigeonholed hold myself if i knew too much hmm. i probably would have limited myself if i knew too much it's and i haven't been afraid to sort of like for lack of a better phrase pick up the scraps you know, and it, when I'm in a room and it's like, you know, who wants to take this on? I'm like, always, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, Sarah, in all of that, though, with all those successes, you know, small successes, big successes, has there been a project or an assignment, a responsibility that just between us scared the heck out of you and you're wondering, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this is going to blow up and I'm going to be the scapegoat or I'm going to look bad. Have, a, yeah. Oh, a, a lot of them. Hmm. Totally. Totally. A lot of them. And, and more so mostly at Fenway. And I think it's because as you get further along in your career and you've sort of earned that where people say, well, we trust that you'll just handle this because there's not a ton of, oversight i'm not i'm not living in a work environment where it's i'm running every single detail by someone but yet you're responsible for a very public forward-facing position in being the look feel of the ballpark you know what's happening at certain times um how will david ortiz's retirement be what does Derek jeter's final game ever you know, look like, I will never understand that for the record, why the Yankees didn't call us and ask us to flip flop a series, but I don't know. <laughs> I guess like, it was a gift. Trust, <laughs> they trusted you too, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, but I was like, are you, what was that, 2014? I was like, I just went through the bombing, so now I have to do Derek Jeter's final uh, game. <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility, especially absolutely. when you don't even know Derek Jeter. <laughs> wow. Right? Um, so those are the things that that really get you and the question is is am i good enough am i right you know am i this so that's where it becomes collaborative and you can kind of bounce it off people and i go back to you know my professional friends and they say sarah i haven't cried yet or that isn't this and that is that and it's it's which is why it's not a chart and it's not a path like and leave yourself enough leeway so that you, you know, if you have a great idea at the 11th hour, you should still do that. You should just work later at night. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you should just commit to staying later and, and doing that because then it makes it the best that it can be. But then everybody says that was awesome. So we don't have to worry about you and we just trust you to do these things. And then you get more projects and then you get more worried about <laughs> what's well, good. I hope everybody likes this. I hope this doesn't flop. <laughs> well, so, so it never really, it never really ends. And the other thing that we talked about earlier is that in the sports and entertainment world, <clears throat> you're always on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the spotlight is always on your work. Mm -hmm. uh, no offense to those who may work in other industries, but 
what they do in their cubicle or what they do in their conference room is usually only known, maybe only known by a few select people, a few yep. customers, a few workers. But what you do, uh, good, bad, or ugly, it's magnified. And so, yeah, I almost, you know, um, sorry, I don't know if you were going to say something oh, else, but I, I almost, um, I don't envy them. I think I have it easier because I think in a lot of ways, I don't want to say that you have a knee jerk reaction or anything like that, but we are not given the gift of time to overthink a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And we're also not given the gift of time to dwell on it very long, you know? So there's this ability to just be like, Oh, well that happened. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> didn't make that person happy. <laughs> You know, but at the same time, you know, you know, if you got it right, it was largely because you didn't have time to run metrics on it or do this or do that. You had a conversation with a couple people and you just went with your gut and you're guided by what is right and what is wrong. And if you can live a life like that, I think that's a gift. You know what I mean? You don't get caught up in the burdens of, of the gray areas. Wow. We just don't have time for that. Can I ask you a question about uh, women in sports? Sure, I am one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> again, a senior vice president, major league team. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are certainly a lot of successful women in sports. You, you've mentioned that already. Uh, I have to ask you though, in a in a in an historically male dominated industry. Uh, have have you found that to be just a very difficult obstacle, um, a fence too high, or is it something that is um, that for you has just really not been an issue or an obstacle? Um, I don't want to say it's been an issue or an obstacle, but it can be part of my navigation, if that makes hmm. any sense. Um, it's a consideration. It's a consideration. And, um, but I don't think it's necessarily been an obstacle, but I would be lying if I said, you know, one of my pregnancies, uh, you know, put, had me in bed for, um, I think I w had a hospitalized bed rest that started in September and ended in January. Hmm. Um, you miss a lot. And people, I think, you know, they naturally so and rightfully so like wonder is she okay is this, is this is what's it going to be like so does do things like that um slow down your career path um i think if you're in the right place no and i don't think it has for me but i do think when you're running neck and neck races with people when you're young that that can be a thing but what i also say is is that the people that you choose to be around in your life and the support system that you choose to have are going to be the ones that have the greatest impact. So the moment that my daughter was born, you know, I worked at a place where I was like, I have been in a hospital for months. <laughs> I need to get out of my house. I actually don't want maternity leave, but I don't want to leave her either. And they're like, bring her. Okay. <laughs> you know, so for the first few months, I was going to work a couple days a week and my daughter was sitting with me in my office. I mean, they all they do is sleep at that age anyway. So what's the big deal? Like right? some of your coworkers do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, and on top of that, when you start saying to yourself like, well, I'm, I'm working in this and, and we talk about the 10 day straight and I'm going to be gone 10 nights in a row mm. and there's the kids have to have bath time and be fed and, the making sure the homework's done and then good night stories and this, you know, you know, the partner you choose in your life plays an enormous role in that. And my, I'm so fortunate because my husband believes in me so much, you know, and, and encourages me. I mean, when we came back here, we came for my career and I'm sure if we had something great, he would say, let's do that. And he has a very successful company of his own. So, which I'm in full support of. So, I think it's more about, um, you know, there are, there are windows in your life where you do have to put some things on pause as a woman in a different way, I think, than men. However, I would not 
looking back, I would not change any bit of that because being a parent, being a part of a family is such a great thing. And in addition to that, um, but I also acknowledge that that's not for everybody, but I think it's really hard when you're, you know, I had my daughter at 26, um, 27. And when you're that age, it's hard to feel like, Oh God, I'm, you know, you're thinking about the things you're, you're missing sometimes because you haven't been around the block enough mm. times to know that this isn't the be all end all of the world. And you're working in an industry that's a lifestyle. So, um, those are the things that I'd, that I would say, I don't think I've been held back because I'm a woman, but I do think the road, because of those pauses, it does naturally take a little bit longer. Um, what I do feel though, is an immense obligation to speak up for others, uh, <clears throat> and remind people. And I, you know, me, I can be a little outspoken, um, <laughs> And, and in my East Coast way, be pretty blunt. Um, and I will remind people when, you know, there aren't enough women at the room or there, you know, isn't enough diversity in the room or there isn't something else that we should be doing. Um, but what I feel like is, is I have a really good bunch of counterparts, um, you know, there was a joke being made um, and someone was talking about um, someone being fragile or whatever. And it was in, re in regards to a woman, but it was during the pandemic and I think she has asthma. So it's like, you're, are you going to be able to come back because you don't, because you have asthma and someone made in, uh, I work with a male counterpart. That's like, you have to stop saying that yeah. <laughs> she's not fragile. <laughs> like she's anything but fragile. And so I was really proud of that counterpart for speaking in that way. Or when, you know, when someone says that's a really great idea and the male card card says, don't be shocked. You know what I mean? <laughs> like stop acting like you're shocked. It's those little things that remind you that you're in the right place mm -hmm. that remind you that you're part of an, a great team. And, um, so that, those are the things I look for in environment. And I don't think I would be at a place that didn't provide that kind of environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're learning maybe anew in 2020 um, that words matter, right? And that just little comments that you referenced, the, the person who gave those comments may not have had any kind of ill will or... No, oh, no, none, none whatsoever. Right? But none whatsoever. Words matter. But I think, would you agree that all of us need to learn... Uh, we, we need to learn how to balance our, the intent of our words. And also on the receiving end, we need to learn how to balance that person may not have any ill will. They just, in fact, the person who said, talked about someone's fragility, they're trying to be sensitive to a colleague. Right. But totally. they can also be misinterpreted as maybe putting down a colleague, like that colleague's not tough enough. Yeah. So, and And also work in a place with enough conversation or be the type of person that is willing to engage in enough conversation because you're smart enough to know that not every single thing you say ever in your life is going to come out a hundred percent as you intended. You know what I mean? That would be like, like imagine if we had a pitcher that threw every single pitch exactly where he intended it to go. <laughs> right? Like yep. that would be, you know, that may yeah. be only, you know, Pedro Martinez. I don't know. But well, and it's, and, it's and really hard. In the world at what they do, and yet they still right. throw balls, right? <laughs> right. So that's sort of what it is. And, and no one meant to throw, you know, everyone wants to throw strikes. Mm. Um, but at, at the same time, like, or home runs or whatever, you know, or hit the home run or whatever it is, but you don't make content, contact 100% of the time. And so knowing that and knowing you're going to mess up, whether that's a, as a human or as a company or whatever, but like you said, like the intent is there, the relationship is there, the, the conversation is there. That's the meat of it, of what gets you through the times and makes you believable mm. for, for me. Sarah, I appreciate, appreciate your insights on that.
let me just, um, I wanna, as we begin to close, I want to ask you just a, a hypothetical. Mm-hmm. So let's imagine that you're teaching a course in how to break into sports. Okay. You're writing the syllabus right now. Okay. What, what, are the, <laughs> what are the three? I'm so professional. <laughs> well, you're an academic too, so. <laughs> there we go. What are the three must-have lectures that you're going to put in into that syllabus? Three topics, things, three things you just say I've got to convey to these students before they can, you know, pass this course. Wow. Um, and if you can't think of three, one's great. I no, know no, it, no, no. I think I think I, I probably if I thought about it, I think of more than three. I just think there's so many important things. Um, I think it would be the senses. Hmm. There would be a really, really kind of weird conversation and syllabus about the senses, about um, and diving a little bit into energy and what you feel when you're in a space and when you're in a building or or, um, things like that. Um, Because it goes to everything. It goes to, you know, just those basic human elements. But on top of that, um, there's a lot about it. That's like, there's a lot of what we do that is building excitement or building tension or recognizing tension and DS. Like it goes into everything. So it's a combination. I would say the senses and energy in talking about that. I would also have there be, you know, a requirement on listening. Mm. Um, and really, really diving into what it means to truly listen, whether that's to listen to the individual, to listen to the group, to listen to the community. And wrapped in listening, I would bring in awareness and pop culture and what is happening in the times and getting out of your bubble. And, you know, I always tell like during the off season, you know, you can have that slow time where you're team is not all that motivated but they're still coming into work and i'm like guys this is the time for the internet like if you want to screw around on the internet this is the time because the internet is awesome (laughs) and you can just stumble onto things like and you can find so many things so when you're wasting time don't waste that time because sometimes just getting out of your own and just you know having that space to breathe and doing that is listening reading is listening it's not always just what am i hearing someone say um and then um i think my third one would probably just be a very very thought out thing of of kindness and what does that really mean and what does that look like in a lot of different ways and how does that together go with bravery and other sorts of things and boldness. Hmm. That's what I would do. You got to teach that course, Sarah. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if anyone wants to take that course. (laughs) You know, those are a lot of soft skills, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to let the listener or the viewer just kind of, I'm just going to let them settle on what you just said, because I think, there is so much there that we typically don't think about, um, we don't consider. Sure, a lot of that is wrapped up in sports, but there's a lot of wisdom in what you just said. I wanna thank you for that. Now, thank you. here's my last question. Um, okay. So you have a couple of kids, your daughter's in college right now. Someday, mm-hmm. Sarah, I don't know, but someday you may be a grandmother, right? I might, I might be. You might be, I don't know. It's not a race. That's what I also tell the young people, Rob. It's not a race. (laughs) And, you know, in the Northeast, we're blessed with this, like, wealth of college students that, you know, want to, whether they're part-time employees or interns or getting into the game. And they're, I hear these people and they're like, I want to finish college in three years so I can do this and I want to do that. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not a race. Mm. You know, you don't get to heaven and someone's like, you won. (laughs) You did it. You did it better than everybody else. Like that's just not that's not my version of how it how it works. Yeah, that's so why good. why would you slow down? Why would you speed up the most fun you ever you know years of your of your life? And that's what I'm always telling the young people. I'm like, it's not a race. Hmm. No, no one wins. 
I, you know, I, I like to, in that same vein, I like to encourage people to exercise professional patience. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to be the SVP of the Red Sox by the time you're 30. No. Right? There are very few Epsteins, right? <laughs> right. But I also probably didn't exercise a ton of professional patience. I was, you know, but um, I think at some point I just moved beyond that. You know, well, so. a lot of it was people recognized that you were just focused on the task at hand. Yeah. And then they accelerated your. There's nothing better than a to-do list. Oh, greatest feeling in the world. Just checking hmm. things off the to-do list. <laughs> now, let's go back to you someday, perhaps being a grandma. Right. So your granddaughter or your grandson asks you, and, and perhaps now you're retired, what was the greatest thing about working for the Red Sox? But whether it was a memory or an outcome, a feeling, what was the greatest thing about working? Uh, and, then, and you're taking them to a game and they're asking you as they're sitting there with you, eating that, uh, eating that hot dog. What would you tell them from your perspective today so far? Oh. Um, so there's, Probably like the internal and the, the external. And I think of more of what it's given to me. Like I have felt unbelievably supported where I work when times have been bad. Like, which is such a phenomenal thing, I think, to say about where you work. Like, I think back, like when you have a health scare or something with a kid or whatever, and it, and and when you feel support during those times, like you don't forget that. You don't forget that. Like when I went on bed rest in San Diego from September to January, I was working for Larry at that time and nothing, like he didn't make me, like it was, it was like nothing ever happened. It was like, you just need to do what you need to do and you need to come back healthy. So when it was like, I don't know what I'm gonna pay you and I don't know what your job's gonna be, but I need you in Boston. It was like, how fast do I get there? And cause you need me. And when I needed you, you were there. So I would say that. And then 1A would probably be just the opportunity to play a role in some sort of, whether it's joy or um, experience for someone else. That's incredibly cool. It's incredibly cool. And I have been so fortunate and I don't take this for granted to be at the Red Sox in a unique time. I mean, the last time the Red Sox had it this good, it was like 1908. <laughs> and, and, and it, the last time we were bringing this much joy, but on top of that, there's been so much else that like goes on and to figure out a way to live your life and impact society through the prism of baseball and through the prism of sports is just such a really unique opportunity. Hmm. And I think, and so I think of what's been great and what I truly appreciate is more of what it's given me. And that goes forward, you know, like I've gotten to do cool things for, you know, fans. I've gotten to do good things for family. I've gotten to do good things for friends. Like, it's all good. It's, it's all good. And it's all been through the prism of baseball. Hmm. Well, I said it once, I'll say it again, Sarah. Um, I'm proud of you. No, thank you. <laughs> you're, uh, uh, you've done a tremendous, done a tremendous thing in your career and you're and what's cool is you're still young enough to do a lot, lot more. Oh, no, thanks. So, uh, thank you for joining us on this on game face execs and, uh, Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. We're going to watch you continue to be successful in <laughs> great things at Fenway. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to the ballpark very soon. hope so. I, yes, I hope so. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for being a part of this episode of Game Face Execs. If you found any of it useful or helpful, please rate or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I always appreciate you referring us to others as well. I'll see you next week. Until then, persuade, Influence, inspire.